Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Today we have Kendall Gretsch. As I said, usually we talk to interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community. She is most certainly an interesting and accomplished member. Three-time Paralympian, seven gold, one silver, one bronze, a triathlete, a cross-country skier, a biathlete, which is cross-country skiing and shooting, and also has a degree in biomedical engineering from Washington University in St. Louis. Kendall, welcome. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is awesome. Now, you had one of the greatest moments of the Tokyo Games. Your finish in the triathlon I want to, can we watch this finish? And I want to figure out a little bit of what was going through your mind as this was happening. So if we can watch the the finish, just the last 20 seconds here. Exactly. The last uh, buildup of an hour race to the last 20 seconds. So. Exactly. So we're talking about a 750 meter swim, a 20K bike ride, followed by 5K run, which you're doing in your racing wheelchair. This is what we're going to is the end of the 5K run. Sprint, that's what we're seeing right now. Kendall Gretsch trying to make Here one last desperate surge. Lauren Parker in the lead for now. Here comes the American Kendall Gretsch. Gretsch. That's right. Parker holding. Gretsch to the outside. Does she have enough real estate? There's that cross-country sprint oxygen. Parker and Gretsch. Oh, Here comes Kendall Gretsch. And at the end, Gretsch gets it done for gold. Just amazing. And when I look at that race and then you look at her handler, Dan Tun, run over, this is a team effort. This is her cross-country ski background that I think really gave her that sprinting capability to finish just eking her out one second. What an amazing race. In 3.1 miles, she made up a minute and 20 seconds. Wow. That'll be gut-wrenching for Parker, who sees her quest for gold come up one second short but it's a silver medal for the Australian Kendall Gretsch her third Paralympic gold medal after two in the winter now, Kendall as you said this is after an hour and it, and it wasn't like you were in a pack this wasn't like you sprinted out of the pack to pass her you caught her and passed her by half a chair length yeah in those last few meters when did you know? Because she was ranked number one in the world. You were ranked yeah. number two in the world. When did you know that you had a chance to win it? Did you know when you got off the bike? When did you know that morning? Did When did you know? Or did you know in that final little sprint that you had a chance to win? Yeah, you know, I think so kind of leading all into Tokyo, I knew that Lauren was going to be, yeah, like she was the gold medal favorite. And I knew I was going to be chasing her the whole time. And so, yeah, I would, you know, had this entire extra year with the postponement of the games, just to think about like, how can I make up the, the factor gap? So she starts four minutes and four seconds in front of me. Because she's a higher level injury, right? Yes. So she- yeah. So she has a higher level injury than I do. So for our sport, they break it into to two subcategories. And the, if you have more function, which I do, I'm um, in H2 and I start back four minutes and four seconds. So I just, that whole extra year I was going through, I looked at every race we had done together and just thinking like, okay, how can I make up the four minutes and four seconds? And where am I going to find all those little seconds? And I knew that it was going to be really close. And so there are just all these moments along the way where it was like, okay, validation that things are going well. I've kind of planned for this scenario and that it might be possible. And I think I first felt that on the bike when I I was getting splits from our coaches on the bike. And um, they so they were telling me each lap of the bike how far back I was. And Lauren's a really strong cyclist. And so I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to even make up time on her. I was just hoping not to lose time. 
So when I was getting the splits and saw that I was making up time on the bike, I was like, okay, I'm having a really good day. It might be possible to make it up. And then, yeah, same thing when I got to the run, every lap I was getting a split and I was making up time, making up time. And then finally I kind of, you know, you start doing the math as much as you can in the middle of a race. And you're like, okay, I'm, I think I'm making up enough time per lap where I can act like it's going to be close. It's going to be a sprint. And yeah, so it was, it was just so cool because that exact finish is what me and my coach had trained for. We were like, okay, if it's a sprint finish, you have to be good at sprinting. And so every single run workout I did leading to Tokyo ended with me doing a sprint finish and just like finishing that way and envisioning that. So, um, yeah, I kind of kind of love that it ended like that. The sprint, not only was it a sprint finish, but you also had like a crazy little like little turns on it, you know, so you had the barriers there and you kind of had to hip your chair around. Were you preparing for that in training too? Yeah, so we were lucky enough. So in 2019, we had a test event on the same course um, and, and they really didn't make that many changes from the test event to our actual actual race in Tokyo and that it it's actually kind of like this steep steeper downhill into a semi sharp turn and when we did that at the test event in 2019 that turn scared me so much because I was like you really got to watch your speed and take it at the right angle and and so it's the same thing I like practice turns like that around my neighborhood in Colorado. And then when we got there ahead of the event in Tokyo, um, we, we had a couple of days where we could be at the venue practicing in the water. And I chose not to do the swim familiarization because I didn't want to risk like getting sick from the water. But when we were there for the swim familiarizations, I went and I looked at that turn and I talked about it with my coach and figured out, okay, what's the best line? How fast can I take it? And really thought about that knowing that it was going to be a critical part of the race it worked out to be a really critical part of the race what was the surface it looked like it was this green surface was that asphalt was it astroturf what was it yeah so they it's it was carpet so that was actually another thing that like made it quite difficult as you were coming through this transition in air, area and that's actually pretty typical for for triathlon Normally it's a blue carpet, um, but that's kind of like the signature. They have a carpet through transition. And um, so it actually made it quite difficult because you're, instead of going over a hard surface, you're going over carpet. So it slows you down. You have to have a little bit more kind of power to, to get through it. Um, and yeah, again, it was just like something that we knew for and, and thought about how, how you could be prepared for that. Right. It's a little softer surface, but at the same time, it also carpet has a grain oftentimes. Like I see this going through through hotels sometimes where, you know, you, you're going down the hotel and all of a sudden you're moving down the hallway and all of a sudden you start moving left or right just because the grain catches the front, your front casters on your wheelchair. And so, so, so you're, you're factoring, you have to factor that in too. It's a little bit softer. There's this grain, there's a, there are the turns, it's a downhill and you were what, I mean, you were what, you were 10 meters behind with like 30 meters to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it was luckily they, they had just enough distance in order to make up the time. Cause yeah, I needed every single inch of the course, um, in order to make up, make up the time and passer. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I kind of like, once I got through the turns and it was just a solid straight line, it, you know, at that point you're kind of just like, okay, put your head down and go as fast as you can. And, and I think at that point too, like I was, I was having so much fun in the race. Like I was lucky I was the, I went the second day of the triathlon races. So all of my teammates that had raced the first day were able to be in the stands and they were going just like absolutely crazy. Every time I went through transition, you know, I'm having a good race. And, and so I, I recognized at that point, I was like, no matter what happens, like, this is just going to be cool. It's going to be a cool race. If I pass or if I don't, I'm having so much fun. And I think 
just having that kind of like peace with the race of regardless of what happened. Yeah, I was like, well, why not just go for it and see what happens? So, um, yeah. And in Tokyo, that had to be a really big deal that you had your friends, your teammates in the stands because they're really because of COVID, there really weren't people in the stands. Yeah, no, the only people that were allowed to be there were like athletes and staff from the, like within triathlon. And so, yeah, it was definitely not like a full stand, but um, yeah, I think my team kind of made up for it. They were, they were quite rowdy. I guess the announcers at some point kept commenting about how, how rowdy the Americans were. <laughs> well, with good reason and with good results. They were rowdy. You missed getting to compete in Rio because you really have been a triathlete. So I knew you more as a, as a cross-country skier because you competed in cross-country skiing before you competed in your first sport of triathlon. Yeah. What was it like to go to Tokyo after, because you'd been the top woman in the world leading into Rio in your classification, but then they didn't have your classification compete. And, and then, and then to be sort of ranked second going into, into Tokyo, what was it like to compete thinking, okay, we had this whole buildup to when I was really great. And now, now I have to sort of hopefully recapture some of that magic that I had before, which obviously you did, but what was it like to be able to get to compete in your first love of triathlon? Yeah, I mean, I think that was just so cool for me because, yeah, in Rito, I was, it was tough. I, like, I enjoyed watching the triathlon as much as I could, but I was also really jealous that I wasn't there and I was missing out on on the event and the experience. Um, and so that was hard kind of being on the sidelines. And um, yeah, but I think the other thing that was really cool is in the four years from Rio to Tokyo, I guess five years, our our sport just grew and changed so much. And so, yeah, I think that was exciting. We had new people coming in, people that were coming and transferring from other sports. So they brought in really great experience and just overall, like the whole level and professionalism of paratriathlon increase so much. And um, yeah, so I guess I didn't really see it as like, having to kind of like get back into the form that I was in prior to Rio because I was like way beyond that um at that point it just was like what it took in order to be the best was so much more and but yeah it was it really was kind of this culmination of the nine years that I've been doing triathlon and um yeah, like very, a very full circle moment in terms of the people that were there. And um, yeah, it just felt like everything kind of came together to make that happen. So triathlon being your first sport and really swimming was was your first big sport, right? I mean, this is what you did growing up, didn't you? Yeah, I, I grew up swimming. Um, as, but I would say more just recreationally or or just like, I didn't know about parasport at all. Um, and so, so yeah, I swam with my neighborhood swim team because that's like what you did in my neighborhood. You grew up going to swim team and I swam in high school. My sister swam in high school. Um, so I was, I'm a competitive person by nature. And, and so I, I could compete with myself and kind of push myself, but I was, never racing really against anyone else. Like I came in last basically every single race that I did. Um, so yeah, it wasn't until I was in college when I found Parasport that really I was able to like fully invest in the sport. But yeah, I do have a background in swimming. Right, background in swimming and, and born with spina bifida. So, so you just you don't have the kick you don't have the stability i mean probably missing some of the symmetry to a certain extent just because it's really hard to be symmetrical with a spinal cord injury but is was swimming the foundation of your triathlon like if you're a good swimmer like i 
I, I always look at those people who are great swimmers and go, oh, yeah, OK, like triathlon makes sense because you're a great swimmer. I was always like petrified of somebody swimming over me or kicking me in the face and all of those things. And the swimming part didn't seem like a great place to start because it seemed like a really good way to be really exhausted before you got to do everything else. But was swimming the foundation for you or because you're also I mean, you won off of the run. Your, your bike sounded like it was great as well. It sounds like you're equally, it sounds like you're pretty strong across all three or is swimming the one? No, I would say, yeah, that's, I I try to be as kind of even across them um, as I can. But I think that it's like, I was a strong enough swimmer. I always say that like in triathlon, I'm like, decently good at all three like I could never go and do the individual sports like I could never just be a swimmer never cyclist never just a runner but I'm pretty decent at all three and um but yeah I think having that background in swimming you're right you start the triathlon with the swim and so if that's just something that you're comfortable with you you do you you don't feel like you're digging yourself into the hole in the first event you're it's almost like okay this is a really great way to set myself up and kind of get in into the groove of things before I have to do the bike and the run and that was an open water swim right yeah we were in like a a harbor area and um so yeah kind of protected but open water kind of protected but open water how did you get into so from going from being a a, a neighborhood swimmer how did you get hooked on the triathlon yeah. So when I was in college, um, I, it, I was my sophomore year and I had stopped swimming. I wasn't really exercising at all. Um, and I was like, well, I should probably start doing that again. And so I started swimming and then I actually read an article about someone that was training with their college team, um, to go to London and he had CP and, and I just didn't really, I didn't know much about the Paralympics at all. The little that I, I thought I knew, I thought that like you, I thought you had to be a full-time wheelchair user every single day. I just, I didn't know. And, and so I thought I like, walk, you walk with crutches though. Most yeah. I ro- walk with crutches, um, like day to day. And so I just thought, I was like, well, I don't use a wheelchair. I don't qualify. And so I didn't, I just didn't get it. And so when I saw that, you know, here's someone that's ambulatory and he has all his limbs, he's not missing a limb. Like that's kind of me, I should look into this. And so, yeah, the summer of, after my sophomore year, I found an, an adaptive um, swim practice through Great Lakes Adaptive Sports Association uh, in the Chicago area. And they had a swim practice. It was like a full day thing, actually. They had swim practice and then after they had track practice. But I just showed up to go swim and just see like, okay, let me check out what Parasport is. And while I was there- To see if you're any good kind of thing. Or just like, yeah, just, I guess, see what it's all about. And, um, so I was at the swim practice and and the person that was running it, she was like, Hey, have you ever been in a racing wheelchair? We have track practice right now. Come over and try it. I was like, okay. And I did that. It was really fun. And she had actually just started a paratriathlon club in Chicago called dare to try. And so after the track practice, she, she was like, Hey, well, we have triathlon practice twice a week down in the city we have a camp coming up. I'm going to sign you up for the camp. After the camp, there's a triathlon. We're going to sign you up for the triathlon. And so, so yeah, I went to one swim practice and kind of got signed up to do all of these things. And I just fell in love with it because it was, yeah, it was an area where I could push myself and set new goals and new challenges. But I was also competing and racing against people that it was like a level playing field for once. And, um, yeah, I kind of just fell in love with that. The pushing yourself, because it sounds like that is a big part of who you are, is being able to push yourself beyond what you've done before, 
and, and and the race is often the race within is what it sounds like. And this might have started as a swimmer in your neighborhood where you're like, okay, well, I might not beat anybody, but I want to keep improving. Yeah. And that mentality, it sounds like it served you really well, though, this this idea of, of pushing yourself and continuing to get better and being fulfilled that way. Is that the way it works for you? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think... I think a lot of endurance athletes are kind of that way of like part of the enjoyment of it is taking on a challenge that seems kind of crazy to begin with. And, and yeah, you're not going to get there in one day or even one year, but it's like these incremental steps that you take along the way to get there. That's really satisfying. And, and, and yeah, sending, setting really lofty goals that, you think might not be possible, but, um, I think you kind of get like these glimmer of hopes along the way when you see the progress of like, okay, things are working. I just keep chipping away, chip away. How did that first triathlon go after that camp? Oh, I mean, (laughs) I don't know if it was like anything stellar, but, but I finished it and I had so much fun. Um, And yeah, I think as soon as I did that, it was like, okay, how, how can I keep doing this? And, and yeah, they were so instrumental there to try and, and helping me stay in the sport. So I was still in school in St. Louis. And so they connected me with an organization there that was able to give me a hand cycle and a racing chair to train with. And, um, one of the coaches in Chicago, knew a coach in St. Louis. And so I would go and I would train with them. And um, yeah, I was just, I was hooked and I wanted to keep doing it. Um, And they made that possible. You had a serious major though, too, in in college. I mean, biomedical engineering. I mean, that sounds like you had to work really hard. How were you able to juggle this, you know, budding Paralympic career with, with a really challenging major? Yeah. And, and I guess by saying like, I was continuing to train, it was nowhere near the level of like what I'm doing now, but it was every opportunity that I had given kind of my circumstances of, you know, being like at that point, my major in school, that was my first priority. But on the weekends, I was like going out and you know, driving to go train with this group or, you know, late at night I would go and I would train with them. And so I found, found moments within the week to train. It wasn't anything like glamorous or, or wasn't serious training, but it was just like enough to kind of keep me, keep me in it and keep me active. Keep you in it and keep you active, but you were coming around at the beginning of the sport too. And well, you won three world championships, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's where things are so different. Like, you know, I said earlier that the sport had progressed and I think that I came in at a time where, yeah, people weren't, weren't, I guess, training like it at the level we are now. And, um, or, or just even like simple rule changes. Like when I first started, we didn't have the subcategories within the wheelchair division. And so, so that was like a big thing that changed, um, you know, as the sport progressed. And so, um, yeah, just as you have more athletes getting involved, you can kind of fine tune the sport and, and really make it more, more fair for everyone competing. How then going from Rio, so you, so you're approaching Rio, you learn that your classification is not going to be in it. And then how did you end up in cross-country skiing? Yeah, that was, again, it was kind of like right place, right time scenario. Um, So yeah, I I had just graduated college and I was moving up to Madison, Wisconsin. Um, And when I was moving up there, the group that I was training with for triathlon, they said, Hey, there's this adaptive ski program in Madison, you know, you should check it out and you know, you might be interested. And and I was like, okay, that sounds, that sounds fun. Like another sport I can try and I'll I'll look into it. 
Um, and then, then yeah, like kind of later in that same year, they made the announcements of what categories were going to be included in Rio and mine wasn't. So then I was like, okay, maybe I should really look into this cross country thing. And um, the director for the Nordic program, he reached out and, and said, hey, you know, you no longer have a medal opportunity in triathlon. Do you want to try Nordic skiing? It's an endurance sport, just like triathlon. And, you know, invited me out to go to a camp and, and try some things out. Um, and, and yeah, it was kind of the same thing. I, I went to the camp and, and loved it and um, was able to, to connect with this group in Madison to keep skiing and connect with one of our development coaches for Nordic that was living, she lives in Minnesota and um, my sister was living there. So I would drive out and stay with my sister on the weekends and ski with the coach like all day. Um, yeah, so, but again, it was like, I don't know if I would have gotten into Nordic if if all of those things didn't line up correctly. What was appealing to you about Nordic skiing? Is it the endurance part or what? what really is appealing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think triathlon and Nordic are, are similar to me in that one, I love that they're outside. So you're, you're getting to travel the world. And as you're racing, you're exploring the places that you're actually traveling to. You're not just staring at the bottom of a pool as you're going. <laughs> um, and so I love that aspect of it. And then, yeah, just the endurance part of, um, yeah, just those the challenge of it, the challenge of the sport. What is what does the challenge mean for you? I mean, it's so easy from the outside to see what that challenge might be, but for you, what's that challenge that really just sort of grips you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's there's something that's somewhat satisfying about like not being great at something. Like the first time you get on skis you know, you're like trying to turn on a Nordic ski and, and you just fall over. Like I still fall over all the time um, when I'm skiing and practicing and we practice maneuvering so much and, and like, but I think- Can you describe the Nordic ski? Sorry, just as to keep paint a picture for people, like what the Nordic ski that you ski in is. Yeah, so you're, I'm sitting, we call it a like a bucket or a sit ski. I'm kneeling in it I kind of have my knees my lower legs tucked back behind me uh and like knees kind of forward um and then yeah you have your two ski poles skiing at the same time and then the skis are fixed two of them fixed together and so when you're turning you can imagine that if you're a stand skier you just pick up your foot and you kind of ski around a turn whereas in a sit ski your, your skis are fixed forward. So you kind of have to find the right balance. You, yeah, you kind of have to like lean over and try and get up on one ski and balance and turn around the around the corner. And um, yeah, finding, finding that balance point is quite tricky to do um, when, when, yeah, Nordic skis aren't, they don't have an edge like an Alpine ski. So you're, they're not really meant to be on an edge, but we, we do it. No. no, not at all. And and in some ways, I mean, it's it's evolved. It almost feels like it started from like your cafeteria chair kind of thing with yes, like your feet yeah. out in front of you with two skis attached to the bottom of it that go in this, these tracks or you don't have to stay in the tracks. And, and, and so that doesn't, yours is obviously way more streamlined and carbon fiber and lighter and higher performance but that's kind of what it started with and you try to think about maneuvering this thing around the turns i mean i do a little bit of nordic skiing and the turns are miserable because yeah <laughs> go around and then and then all of a sudden i'm like i've gone to a i've, I've ground to a halt and then the turn leads to a hill and so then i have no momentum going up the hill and it's just, it can be brutal. So to watch you guys, to watch some of the videos of what you guys do going around the turns, getting it up on one one edge. So this is, there's no articulation. It, everything's everything's flat and you have mm -hmm. to put it up on edge and balance on top of it while the ski is canted in. It's really amazing what you do, but it's all about going faster and maintaining momentum, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's a terrifying thing when you first learn, I think, because the only way you can get up on edge is if you're going fast. And so you're so hesitant when you begin. And it's like this learning process where you're, you're so timid and every single time you go, go through a turn, you're like, oh, I don't want to fall. I don't want to fall, but you're never going to be able to get up on an edge. And so you almost have to have this mind shift of like, I'm just going to go for it. And I'm going to like go as fast as I can. And I'm probably going to fall over and I don't care if I fall over, but that's the only way I'm going to learn. And you, yeah, you kind of have to just like put yourself in the mindset of like, I'm about to fall a lot. <laughs> it's like, I mean, most people who are watching probably had learned how to ride a bike, but they probably don't remember learning how to ride a bike. Yeah. But yeah. If, if you thought about it as an adult, like learning how to ride a bike is probably very similar to making a turn on this cross country ski where you know, as a kid, yeah, you fall over, but you fall all the time as a kid and you don't have all that far to fall. Right. <laughs> well, luckily we are pretty low to the ground because we're sitting. So, and snow is, can be soft. It can also not be soft, but. <laughs> but you can also be stuck. You can yeah. fall and fall softer in, inside of the track and then you're stuck and you can't get back up and <laughs> you need yeah. a tow truck and all those yeah. things. Not that you really have a tow truck, but. Yeah. And I think kind of back to your question about like, what, what is it in the challenge? And, and I think, yeah, like I, I've had all these really great examples of teammates that are, are doing all these things. Like I have teammates that maneuver around these corners so smoothly and expertly. And so you, you kind of, you get that seed in your mind of like, okay, it's possible. Like I, I can get there if I just kind of like put in the work. And, and I think that's the same thing with, with triathlon and, and the speed of it. It's like, okay, other people are doing this. They're going just as fast. Like I just have to figure out how to get there. How do I figure out to get faster? Um, but yeah, once I know it's possible, it's like, I'm all in and figuring it out. You have to have a good engine, right? I mean, you are an endurance sport athlete, but you're also going from cross-country skiing and biathlon and we've got to talk about biathlon because it sounds like you're a pretty good shooter too <laughs> and so cross-country skiing biathlon and then going into triathlon which is then three different sports yeah so you are training for five different sports and there's not really a break more than a couple of weeks in your season what is it yeah. like for you to be in season all the time yeah, I think I think you have to accept that like you're not going to be great all season. And and so yeah, I'm kind of in it right now in the triathlon season where I actually I took a, a kind of the longest break I ever have after Beijing and 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 so you you know fitness dropped really low and but but kind of accepting that like that's okay for right now. Like I I don't have to be in top form for the first race of the year or the second race of the year really the only race of the year that matters is the final one like if it's the Paralympics or if it's the world championship race you know kind of whatever your key race is for the year um and so yeah you kind of have to accept that like a lot of the season you're not going to feel great and you're like building towards feeling great and especially in the transition between the two seasons it, I think it can be tough because yeah, pretty much the whole year, like you're the cardio fitness is there. Like you're, we're very cardiovascularly fit. It's just that sport specific strength that you're kind of building up. And so figuring out how to, how to kind of limit yourself or, or read yourself in that, like, okay, it feels like if I were just looking at my heart rate, it feels like I should be able to go faster, but my muscles are just not there yet. And if I push myself more, I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to be sore for like a week. And um, yeah, so kind of knowing, knowing that and finding the right balance. And um, yeah, I mean, my, my two coaches work really well together and they, they kind of manage that transition and really well for me. And 
um, make sure that I'm not like jumping in too quickly between the two seasons as well. Um, yeah, but I've, I've had practice now that I've done it multiple seasons in a row. Patience is the hardest thing for an athlete. And what you're saying is you put yourself in a position where you have to be super patient and believe that it's all going to build to the final race, which is the most important race. Are you really good at patience? No, I would say, so like you're, you're accurate that you do have to have patience and just like the self-belief that things are going to come around. Um, but I think that's where you need like a really sound coach and, you know, like a sports psychologist and a lot of people to kind of talk you out and yeah, just like convince yourself that, okay, like it's okay that you're not where you want to be it's actually unreasonable for you to be there and like let's take a step back and recognize that and and so yeah I I try to be patient and like logically I know that no I shouldn't like I'm not going to be where I was at my peak form in Tokyo um but it's still hard where like you're showing up to practice every day and you're like why am I just not as fast as I was like I know I should be faster um but then yeah along the way you do you kind of get these markers where it's like okay this was like a good workout I can I can see the progress and so you kind of hopefully string more and more of those together to finally get to that that peak form so the coaches and the sports psychologists are the ones who are providing the rational thought and you as the athlete are a little bit less rational. Is that, <laughs> is that fair? I would, yeah, I would say so. I try to be rational in general, but, uh, but I'm, I'm not great at it a lot of times. So yeah, you need the voice of reason from an outside perspective, I think, but, but also I think it's good that like, it's again, a balance, like you want to have a little bit of like that irrational voice because that's like that's what's pushing you that means that you care like you're not okay with just settling with where you're at and that you know like okay I I've got work to do and and so yeah it's it's a balance between the two for sure that's your dreamer your irrational voice is the yeah. dreamer <laughs> we can yeah. do the impossible like let's go let's do it what could because being a two-sport athlete especially now is, is fairly irrational just because you really don't have any downtime and and it is it's just really hard it people are really good and it's hard for you to be successful so do you enjoy that part of it that part of the the really hard training the really hard like most people can't do it is that part of the appeal for you too um I think I think part of it is well one I really hate training on a bike trainer and so the thought of having to be in a bike trainer all winter long is is like miserable for me so I think that yeah it's hard because you're you're kind of on or in a season more than most people are but I think I think there's a couple factors that make it doable. I think one being a sitting athlete, like I, I think on the cross country side, there's, there's just less technique to learn. You don't have skate and classic and, you know, within that there's all the different techniques. And so for us, it's like you're double pulling, that's what you got. So <laughs> um, I think that that makes it a little bit more manageable. I, and I think it's also, probably pretty good like if you're just using your arms if you're only doing one thing over and over and over again like the risk of injury I think is higher so kind of adding in the variety it it adds longevity and and mental longevity too because you're changing it up and it's fresh and kind of as you get burnt out on one it's like okay well no it's time to switch over so um it's hard but I think I think it's like 
in reality, I think it's maybe a little less hard than than what it looks like on paper. It's I mean, I, I was a two sport athlete as well. So I I appreciate what you're doing. And but it also was interesting. I mean, like for me, oftentimes leaving ski season, like Boston Marathon was often one of my my first long run. Like get to see everybody, get the juices flowing. You're like, here, I'm here. No, I'm not. No, I'm not fit. I'm not going to do well, but I'm excited to see everybody. And this is going to remind me to get going. And yeah, yeah I think there, there is something about the playing aspect that you said too, that the idea of, of being on your trainer for three hours, watching a movie or something like that and pedaling along on your bike, it gets really old really quickly. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That does, it does not appeal to me at all. I've, I've done it before and yeah. So I, I much rather be out skiing and, you know, skiing in the mountains and traveling and um, yeah. It, and it, I think it just, the mental freshness that you have, I think is worth it. Well, mental freshness. It's interesting that you say that because you had Tokyo with this absolutely spectacular finish in Tokyo, uh, which you have to be on top of the world finishing, moving forward. And then you went quickly into the Nordic season. In Nordic, not only did you have Paralympics, you had world championships in January. Then you had the Paralympics in March. How are you doing mentally? I mean, the mental fatigue can be much worse than the physical fatigue. Totally. I think that was that was the hardest part. Like when I got to the end when Beijing was over, I, I was just like mentally exhausted from it. And, and I tried to get ahead of it. Like after Tokyo, I, I really did take like a solid break where it was like, I'm not going to do anything unless it's like, I want to go out and ride my bike because it's nice outside. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I took, it was probably about two weeks or so where I, I took off and um, before kind of getting back into things for the Nordic season. Um, but I think it was especially tough because of COVID, like the restrictions that we had for the winter, um, leading into Beijing, just like trying to avoid, I mean, at that time, like life was kind of going back to normal for people, um, you know, but you had this like huge wave of COVID from Omicron and, and I think rightfully so the rest of the world was like, well, if, you know, I'm vaccinated and I feel comfortable and safe going out, but, you know, we were still very, very, very strict. And so having to like really isolate and having that paranoia of like, I cannot get COVID at all, like the risk. Yeah, of respiratory issue for you is a really big deal. Yeah, there there's that aspect of it, the respiratory issue, but even like if you know, if you test positive then you get knocked out of of traveling and then you can't go to a competition, you can't participate in that and you know, getting that race experience is so important and or just the on snow experience and um yeah, and then like before Beijing there was this really long window where if you tested positive in that you were not getting on the plane to fly over to Beijing. So I think that fear of, of having to isolate and, and yeah, just like the paranoia around that really added to the mental strain. Um, not saying that it would have been easy if, if like that wasn't the case and we weren't living in COVID times, but um, that, that I think was, the hardest part for me too. In addition to balancing your sports, are you are you still working as well, working in your field? No, I'm not. <laughs> I I did for a bit, and uh, yeah, I kind of was. I like eased my way out. I was working full time, and then I was like, well, maybe I'll I'll do like part time. And so then I started doing part time, and then and then it just like quickly became evident that 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 was not going to be sustainable. And um, so, yeah, I'm not, not working anymore. How does that fit with what you're doing with your career in sports? Do you, do you have a timeline of how long you want to compete before you want to go back to 
you know, to, to what you worked on in college, right? to what you prepared for yeah um I think I think it's definitely like a factor that plays into to how long I'm going to be doing sport because I know that I have this other area where I'm really interested in pursuing and um you know kind of building that career and outside of sport um and can you describe what you do like what what that area because Biomedical engineering, in, in some ways, it sounds super, super impressive, but I don't know exactly what it means. Yeah, well, so I guess um, th that's what I studied in college. The job that I had was basically unrelated. Um, so I worked for a software company that makes all of the software um, that hospitals use. So hospitals, outpatient. Um, yeah, if you have like a my chart where you can like log in online and see your results my company made that software. Um, and so I worked for them doing like tech support stuff. I worked with a number of big hospital systems and kind of supporting their IT teams. Um, yeah, so it's probably very boring <laughs> to most people, but I really enjoyed the work and, um, and, and yeah, I don't know if that's exactly what I'll go back to when I'm done, but, um, but just yeah, the idea of, of kind of having more of like that mental challenge I, is is something that I'm looking forward to. Um, but I also recognize that by competing in sport, it, it does have somewhat a timeline on it in terms of you know your age and ability to be to be competitive. And so I want to take advantage of that while I can. And it's a unique opportunity to travel the world and compete. Um, so yeah, I think as long as I'm, I don't have like a set date of like, okay, I'm going through this games and then I'm done. Um, but as long as I'm enjoying it and um, kind of love the day-to-day -day training and the competing, I, I'm going to stick with it and then eventually get back to, to more of a, <laughs> a regular typical job. More of a grown-up life kind of thing sometimes. Your sports, is there one of, because you have five different events effectively, five different sports effectively that you do, is one more challenging than the other? Because it's also interesting that you're talking about the mental part of, of, of what you're doing outside of sport, but there's a lot of the mental part of what you're doing in sport too, I would imagine. So is one more challenging than the other? I think for me... The hardest, the hardest one to enjoy would be the bike. <laughs> I'm like learning to learning to enjoy being on my bike and riding my bike. Um, Why is that? I don't know. I think maybe it's it's the longest part of the triathlon, and so it just seems like so disproportionately long. But it's it's long part, but it's also it's a sprint. I mean, you you averaged almost 21 miles an hour in Tokyo so 20 point 20 and two-thirds miles an hour in Tokyo so you were going fast yeah but it was 12 and a half miles so 35 minutes almost 36 minutes right but it's so it's like a really long effectively almost like a sprint for a long time is that yeah the, yeah, the name yeah. is a bit of a misnomer like the distance that we compete in for triathlon they call it a sprint distance but like the whole thing takes over an hour, like no way is that a sprint. <laughs> so there is right. some pacing that's going on for sure. Like you're not going all out by any means for the whole uh -huh. thing. Um, but you're trying to stay just below like red line kind of yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. in, in a painful, painful threshold right there. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, and that's part of it is like finding that edge and finding, yeah, how long can you kind of, stay in that that spot where things aren't comfortable and you're hurting and and um yeah that's uh, again it's like another aspect that's really interesting to play out is finding that line finding that because there's not much of anything to distract you it seems like i mean because with the bike the the sort of technical aspect of being on a bike is you you pedal and then you keep pedaling so I think that's really... maybe why I don't like the bike as much is like 
there are less things to distract you where, you know, swimming and in the racing chair, they're both really, really technical. And so you're, you're trying to think about like, okay, your stroke and your form, and there's maybe a cue that you can have to think about. So, so yeah, I tend to like bike courses that we have that are like hilly or maybe there is more technical components because for me, it's breaking up the, that bike into to chunks. And so you can kind of have that mental break of like, okay, I'm not going to look at this whole 20 K bike ride at once. I'm going to look at it, you know, one K at a time because the segments I can break it into that whole racing on like, uh, you know, they, they've had some races where you where like, you know, like airports or whatever, you know, like on the tarmac kind of thing where you can see forever, like that would be absolutely the worst possible race for you. It sounds yes, like. that would be terrible. We have a couple of races where we're actually on an F1 course and, and those are a little bit like, not quite enough going on for me because they're pretty flat and you're just like looping around and uh yeah I mean I'm sure if you're going like 120 miles an hour they're very technical but on a bike they're not as exciting <laughs> yeah, those turns down is significant that's interesting because as I asked the question I thought that it really might be more of the biathlon because it's just there's so much but it sounds like that might be more compelling to you with you know skiing and shooting yeah I mean I guess like from a mental challenge biathlon definitely has that and I think that's what I like of it it's it's like when you're shooting you're trying to master your mind and also you know there's there's obviously like the the skill to it the practice of it um yeah kind of like how how can you hold the rifle all those different things, but a lot of it, at least for me, is really mental of like, am I in the right, right mental space when I'm going into the range to be able to shoot well? Um, yeah, so I think that that's an appealing challenge, whereas the bike is hard for me because it's maybe, it's it's the one I enjoy the least training. <laughs> so that's why the hard, it's the hardest. That is interesting. Can you describe what you go through in a biathlon, like how much you ski and then how you get into your shooting position and, and how that has to work and like dropping your heart rate, all those things? Yeah, so it I guess it depends on the race of how much we're skiing, but it it's somewhere between like 2K to 2.5K, the loops that we're doing. Um, before you come into the shooting range and and yeah you kind of pick out on the course all right like when when is a spot on the course where you're going to start transitioning our coach says like when are you going to transition from being a skier to a shooter so maybe it's like 100 meters out from the shooting range you really start like okay I'm going to back off my pace skiing I'm going to really focus on my breath and try to get on in the breathing rhythm that I'm going to have when I'm shooting, kind of think about mentally like, all right, what's my shooting process, whatever your cues are to kind of get mentally in the right spot. Um, and then, yeah, we, we pull up to the mat, the shooting mat, um, and we'll have a coach that's there. They have our rifle. Um, and then I'll tip over. So I'm in the sit ski and I tip over and I'll get on my stomach and they pass off the rifle to me. So you have your ski behind you then. So you're, you're completely on your stomach. You're not lying on your side. Yeah. So I flip down on my side and then kind of like swing my skis around behind me. So then I end up on my stomach. Yeah. It's a bit of a contortionist move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some practice. You got to be stay flexible to do that. Um, yeah. And so then you get handed the rifle, you kind of, we wear, while we're shooting, we have um, a cuff on our arm. And then, so you clip the rifle into that cuff and that just helps you stabilize the rifle. Um, and then, yeah, you look through the sights and kind of line it up with the target. We have five targets um, that you hit every time you go into the shooting range. And a lot of it, I think a lot of people think that 
you know, you're sitting there waiting for your heart rate to come down. Um, but really like, that's just not going to happen. We practice to be shooting with a high heart rate. And so for What's me, a high the, heart rate? I would say typically when I'm shooting, it's probably about like 160 or so. Okay. So if like my max heart rate is around like one, 175 or so. So it's not really that much off of your max. It's down a little bit, but not a ton. Um, so really it's about like getting in your breathing rhythm. And then when you're breathing, it kind of moves your rifle. So you can line up with the target and kind of get on that center, center of the target um, and shoot. So yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of, I guess the process of it. And then you go through, we have the five targets. And then as soon as you're done with the five, you just kind of like sit yourself back up as quickly as you can and go out and ski as fast as you can. So that's like, you want to practice getting really efficient of like getting down quickly, getting set quickly and getting back up quick. Are you able to forget what happened in the range when you go out and ski? I mean, if you, if you make all five, you're like, okay, I'm great. If you miss all five, are you beating yourself up? How does, how does this work? Or are you just back focusing on skiing? Um, yeah. I mean, if you missed all five, I think it would be pretty hard not to be thinking about that. Um, but yeah, you try to like the, the our sports psychologist that we work with in the winter, he, it's called the penalty loop. So if you miss a shot, you usually have to ski around the penalty loop, however many shots you miss. And so he always says, call it the reset loop. And so you're using that to kind of like mentally reset yourself, get ready to ski the next loop, but then also get in the right mindset for the next shooting stage. Um, and yeah, I think for me, a big thing is trying to think about it more from less from like a fear perspective. So if I come into the range and I'm thinking like, okay, I can't miss, I can't miss, I can't miss more times than not, like I end up missing something. But if I, if I think like, okay, I can do this or like I've done it before, then, then just having that confidence and backing yourself. It's, it's amazing. It's like, you're just, it's words you're speaking in your head. It's not actually changing your process, but it, it seems to have an effect. So you've been so successful over a variety of different sports. What do you consider to be your greatest strength? Yeah, I mean, I guess like being able to do all of them, the adaptability of it. And um, uh, I don't know, I think as an endurance sport athlete, you just kind of have to have like a little bit of like grit to you where you're willing to just like put in that hard work. And I think, yeah, regardless of the sport, the, the biggest thing is just the work that it requires. And so if you kind of have that grit and the determination to put in the hard work, then um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like baseline of <laughs> what you need. Well, we were, we were in an event in April, right? And they did a video with you and your parents and I, feel like I remember your parents saying that you were the the daughter that you or the child that they had to make sure like went to bed like stopped studying yeah this kind of thing have you always had that grit and if so where did it come from yeah I think so uh I don't know I guess I guess like for me in school it was always like well like I know I can get the answer to this math problem, I just have to like do the work to get there. And so I, I think that was like, I was never just going to go to sleep because like there was work still left to be done. Um, and, and yeah, so I think that mindset kind of translates over as an athlete, like, yeah, you kind of, yeah, just the idea of like, okay, I just have to put in the work and like that that's what you do. And you just you keep putting in the work till you get there. Well, I mean, it seems like you've, you've put in a lot of work. You've had a lot of success. Uh, we wish you 
great success in the future. Thank you so much for joining us, Kendall. Yeah, thank you. This is great. This is really fun. Good, good. Well, I hope you enjoy it. And, and good luck as the season progresses. We'll be waiting to hear as you continue to build toward that toward that final race of the year. Uh, but thanks so much. This has been awesome. And thank you all for tuning in. We hope that you've enjoyed it. If you have enjoyed it, please tell your friends. Please tell other people to tune in. We'll have another great guest next week. This will be a traditional podcast. And when it's published as a podcast, please follow us. Please like us. And we will continue to bring you great content. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.